it is my pleasure uh, to be able to uh, give this presentation on behalf of our untouched investigators and our paper that will be uh, is published in circulation. So the subcutaneous ICD, as we've already discussed, was provided to protect uh, patients from sudden cardiac death while avoiding the complications of transvenous lead systems. However, with the first generation devices, inappropriate shocks uh, turned out to be the Achilles heel of this device. Um, and there were many inappropriate shocks. Um, the, this restricted it largely to young patients, often without much structural heart disease uh, because of the long-term need for defibrillator implantation. The most common indications for ICD, however, is primary prevention for patients with a reduced ejection fraction. And those patients had been largely underrepresented uh, in SICD studies until the post-approval study, Praetorian and now Untouched have been uh, published. There have been no prospective study evaluating the outcomes of SICD using modern devices as well as prescriptive programming. So the design of this study was a multinational study, uh, prospective over 100 sites uh, with follow-up pre-specified for 18 months. <clears throat> we also had prescriptive programming uh, so that the conditional zone, no therapy was given for any rates below 200, and we use the discrimination algorithms all the way up to 250 beats a minute. Patients had to have a primary prevention indication, an ejection fraction less than 35%, and it had to be a de novo initial implant of an SICD. Finally, they had to pass the screening test and the usual caveats of previous ventricular arrhythmias or pacemakers were, pacemaker indications were contraindications. <clears throat> The primary endpoint, uh, since this was not a randomized study, <clears throat> was a performance goal, a 95% uh, <clears throat> probability of being greater than 91.6%, a bit of an odd number. Uh, that was derived from the mated RIT uh, trial of defibrillator patients and the arms that uh, were the most aggressive with either long duration or high rates. That was the most aggressive transvenous ICD study, and we said we're gonna do as well as that trial. The secondary endpoints were all cause shock rates, as well as uh, procedural related complications. If we look at our population, we'll see that this is quite different than traditional SICD trials. The age was 56, still a little bit younger than transvenous systems. However, we can see that a majority of patients have ischemic heart disease, the mean ejection fraction was 26% in this trial, and almost 90% of patients um, had a history of heart failure. Um, there was very good baseline medical therapy, including 95% on beta blockers and 75% on uh, vasodilators. <coughs> there were 1,111 patients, so a very large study that was performed uh, that passed the screening only about one out of four patients had the automatic screening algorithm um, done as this came in relatively late in the study. A vast majority of patients passed more than one screening vector. And again, the procedural duration was less than one hour, very similar to what we see in Praetorian. At this study, um, as, we, as this device is simpler to implant than it was earlier on. Importantly, the third generation devices which came in during the study in which the smart pads filter is automatically activated was present in a majority of patients, about 60% of patients. So if we look at the primary endpoint, um, we see, I think quite impressively, um, that uh, the freedom from inappropriate shocks was 95.9%. Um, that means there's only a 4.1% inappropriate shock rate uh, noted at 18 months. Um, so extremely low, uh, very, very rewarding, and clearly uh, easily beat uh, the performance goal we set up based on the made it um, RIT study. If we look at the predictors of inappropriate shocks in a multivariate analysis, a couple of surprises uh, came along. 
Atrial fibrillation was a predictor, which is not a surprise. <clears throat> the other one was two incision technique, which has become the standard for this device. Those patients had more inappropriate shocks uh, than those with a three incision technique. Um, and again, a bit surprising is that ischemic etiology, patients with coronary artery disease was a predictor of fewer shocks. Also generation three devices, those with smart pass filter had fewer shocks, uh, which is what we'd expect. <clears throat> If we look here at a little bit further at these data, uh, we can see that for patients with the generation three device or the smart pass um, devices, there was only a 2.9% inappropriate shock rate at 18 months, uh, which is quite impressive. Whereas for those with the older generation device, uh, it was uh, around 6%. And again, if we look now at the two incision uh, versus the three incision technique. The older three incision technique had a 2.5% inappropriate shock rate, whereas the two incision was a 4.9% uh, inappropriate shock rate at 18 months. Um, <clears throat> although I should say that this was probably not due to anything acutely with the implant, since most of the shocks were greater than 30 days, and they weren't due to myopotentials of uh, the device of the lead moving from the two incision technique. So if we just compare this with previous SICD studies, uh, which I show you on this slide, the original IDE study, which we did to get approval for this device uh, by the FDA, there was an annual shock rate of 13, inappropriate shock rate of 13%. The effortless, which is a very large study from Europe, was at 8%. The post-approval study, the very large uh, study in the U.S., we recently uh, presented is 6.8%. Uh, there was an initial study looking at the smart pass filter, which was down to 4.3%. Praetorian, again, is in that range between 4 and 5%. Untouched is down to 3.1%. And when we use the smart pass filter, the generation three uh, devices, we're now down to 2.4%. Um, you know, quite an impressive curve. Uh, and I think even more importantly, if we now compare that with transvenous systems in the large trials, either meta-analyses or the major trials of mated RIT and the advanced three trials, we see that using the generation three, the smart pass filter um, in SICD devices, we're actually lower than those devices. So rather than this being a trade-off of using an SICD, because more inappropriate shocks, we at least have the trend suggesting that we may actually be preventing inappropriate shocks with this device. <clears throat> if we look at all cause shock rate, um, again, uh, we see that the predictors of, of all cause shock rate um, uh, were either atrial fibrillation or a lower ejection fraction, not surprising. We met our performance um, outcome. And uh, what we can see is that the all cause shock rate uh, was around 9% or so uh, at uh, 18 months. So that's including both inappropriate and appropriate shocks. If we want to look at the efficacy of therapy, again, another concern of the SICD of how well it will it work. Uh, we see that <clears throat> the final shock efficacy for discrete episodes is 98.4%. The one episode which was a, a recurrent uh, VT hovering around the 200 beats uh, per minute, um, spontaneously terminated. And for VT storm, 100% of the episodes were terminated with the shock. So again, very high efficacy, very similar type of numbers to what we see with uh, prospective studies of transvenous systems. If we look at complication rates, Again, overall complication rates were very low. Uh, we previously published, uh, Dr. Borisma was the first author on this of the 30-day results of complications. And we see the 30-day complication rate was between four and 5%. And going all the way out to 18 months, we're still only around 7% or so um, complication rates um, in this study. So uh, very, very, um, very, very uh, low rates. I have a list of the complications here, which we can see, but I think very importantly, um, 
The overall infection rate requiring intervention was about 1%, uh, fairly typical of devices. But importantly, once again, none of these infections resu resulted in bacteremia. There was a relatively low uh, syncope rate uh, for that uh, overall for this. And importantly, I think consistent with Praetorian, uh, for the number of patients who needed to be replaced with a transvenous device uh, because of bradycardia pacing, antitachycardia pacing, or resynchronization therapy was only 0.5%. So again, the need for pacing therapy um, in appropriately selected patients is quite low. Overall, we look at survival, and again, this is not a cherry-picked population, but this was a high-risk population with a mean EF of 26%. And we can see the overall survival rate was about 95%, so only about 5% died. Um, the usual sort of uh, distribution, uh, since we didn't have Brady or antitechcardic pacing, it's important to look at the arrhythmic deaths. And the three arrhythmic deaths we saw, uh, two of them were due to PEA, which a device is not going to prevent. The third one was due to asystole, and certainly heart failure patients with asystole, in general, we don't believe that pacing or any other therapy are going to help those patients. So again, in my opinion, uh, reassuring uh, that this device is safe uh, and effective. So just in conclusion, I think what we can say from Untouched is that we have low complication rates. We have a high success rate for terminating ventricular arrhythmia similar to transvenous uh, devices and a very low inappropriate shock rate uh, without compromising patient safety. So I think what we conclude from that is the SICD can be considered in all primary prevention patients without pacing indications regardless of underlying heart disease or LV function which I don't think we could say before we had these most recent studies. Moreover, the prescriptive programming in this device, the comfort of being able to go to 250 beats um, a minute before uh, automatically shocking patients appears to be safe uh, and effective in this group of patients. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, Congratulations on the news of having this accepted to circulation. That's great. Um, wanted to touch, go back to the, the, the registry component of this study, though, because I think it's important for viewers to, to be able to make the distinction between this registry and publications coming from Effortless and PAS, so that the other registries that are out there. So um, give it to us again. What is really important about this registry study? Well, I think this was a prospective trial, which is a little bit different than some registries. Um, uh, it was the first, I think, purely prospective trial. It didn't have any uh, previous ones. And more importantly, in my mind, is we use prescriptive programming. So virtually everyone, I mean, 99% of patients were all programmed in the same way in a very aggressive fashion so we can understand the programming aspect of this study uh, which i think is important and as a registry we couldn't um, again choose low risk patients these were all high risk primary prevention patients so it's the sick patients that we see in everyday life and not a patient with long qt syndrome or you know a 29 year old with primary vf who clearly need defibrillators in appropriate situations, but they're much lower risk of, of having serious complications. So it, it sounds like you feel that the patient population included here really reflects real world practices? Yeah, certainly real world primary prevention patients, which is the largest um, uh, which is the largest uh, trial um, uh, that has been able to, you know, look at these sorts of factors. And another thing that I think uh, would be good to stress a little bit too is the difference between the generation two and generation three devices and the smart pass filter, because that clearly was a big part of, of your registry patients and did impact the uh, uh, inappropriate shocks. So, can you go over that a little bit for us? 
Right. So uh, the smart pass filter uh, is, a, is a way of changing the algorithm of, dis of discriminating arrhythmias to try to associate inappropriate um, rhythms, which so ones that we should would be withholding therapy. Uh, initial, the initial published study from this, uh, we had done some initial bench work suggesting that it would be very effective. Uh, the initial study coming out of the Netherlands when they looked at their series um, of patients suggested it might reduce inappropriate shocks by about 50%. And very consistently, our data uh, with that showed a 50% reduction in inappropriate shock rate uh, with this filter turned on. So, uh, and this smart pass overall uh, strategy turned on. So it's, um, so clearly it's a game changer in my opinion that it takes us from a low rate of inappropriate shocks to, uh, again, what looks to be an ultra low rate of inappropriate shocks, you know, rivaling or bettering transvenous systems or anything else that we have out there. And I'm a little curious still about the two versus uh, three incision technique and, and, and how you think that the impacted outcomes can, yeah, what I, kind of advice are you gonna give us as we put these devices in? It's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, we're planning to do much further analysis on that because we were a bit surprised by that. Uh, I've spoken with Dr. Knopf's as well uh, about that. It'll be interesting to talk about that a little more um, you know, in the discussion section, but the difference is you're not putting uh, the incision, um, the, the top, the superior incision um, by the sternal notch uh, in this group of patients. So, um, you know, does the lead move um, or do you not tunnel it quite as well? And if the lead moves, you know, more off of the midline, um, you know, are you then starting to get uh, myopotentials, you know, coming from pectoral muscle uh, which would be one cause. Do you have more movement in general from the lead? Um, you know, we're not certain of that because we've not yet done the analysis to uh, to look fully at um, uh, to look fully at uh, all um, you know all of these episodes so we can really uh, do a deep dive in them. But still, you know, even with the two incision technique, the inappropriate shock rate was quite low. It just was not as low as with the three incision technique. So again, I, I, we, did, we have not stopped using two incision technique. It's made us be a little more careful about it and make sure that we're uh, doing the right thing and that we have the lead where we want that lead to be. Um, but it's, it's not deterred us. And we've not gone back to three incision technique because we still have, with the smart pass filter on, we still have a lower inappropriate shock rate than with any other system we could use. Um, any other sub-studies uh, or further analysis that we can expect coming out from Untouched? Yeah, I, I think there are several more that we're looking at. Um, you know, we certainly want to look at this two versus three incision technique, uh, which I think will be important. Um, we're going to probably be pooling some data with the uh, post-approval study, since that will give us a very large cohort of patients. Um, the nice thing about the post-approval study is that we have a five-year long-term follow-up with that, and we're already looking at three-year data in that study. Um, but being able to combine uh, several SICD, um, you know, large registries will just increase our power to be able to ask more questions about arrhythmias, both appropriate and inappropriate uh, rhythms. Uh, 